So I'm going to go backwards and do the uh, talk first, and then we'll do the meditation, and that'll kind of bring us close to the end and have some time for Q&A. Uh, but what I, what I want to talk about uh, as a introduction to the meditation I want to offer, but also as a point in the day, uh, is really how do we integrate all the pieces that we've talked about, or how do we integrate all the uh, parts of meditation experience? Because... Um, because meditation is such an experiential thing, uh, we can talk about various aspects of the experience. We can talk about the different aspects of the way the Buddha laid out experience. We can basically talk to we're blue in the face, but how do we take the information that we have, that we agree with, that we understand on, on some level, and actually apply it to direct experience? So it's so easy for somebody like me or any of us to say you should have compassion for your pain. And, and even intellectually, I'm like, oh, that sounds like a, a good idea. And then when I'm in, when I'm in the experience of pain, I, I sometimes I can't find this, the compassion switch, uh, even though I know that that's maybe the right idea. So I, how do we integrate in some degree, we could say in a very basic way, Buddhism is a practice of wisdom and compassion. And so how do we integrate wisdom and compassion in a way that they're whole? Because really, wholesomeness, being whole, is about not excluding any parts of my experience. And so even, even meditatively, you know, coming into contact with the mind and how it operates in a very real and very honest way, we can see that the mind actually really does want to compartmentalize. Uh, the mind has different things it wants to get rid of. It has an agenda. When I meditate, I want, it to be, I want, I want my body to be comfortable. I want to be pleasant. I, I don't want to be tired, but I don't want to be restless. You know, I'm like the three little bears. You know, I want it to be just right. <laughs> I don't want too hot, too cold. And if I could get everything just right, then I would actually be happy. <laughs> and so that, even in and of itself, is a huge setup for aggravation and disappointment. Uh, because even if it is just right, you're probably just going to find something else that's not quite right. So sometimes we just have to be honest about where we land in our, basically, in our value system around wisdom and compassion. And even therapeutically in our work and our context that, you know, we're usually geared towards one or, one or two camps. You know, there's the, there's the wisdom person who's the intellectual person, who's the smart person, who really values knowledge. And that uh, even in the way we work with ourselves and other people, we can be uh, pushing that type of context of like uh, knowing things and being smart and having all the answers and being wise is really, really important and most important. And I think culturally, that's sort of the view anyway, is that we really value that. And the other side is that actually we might value the compassion or the empathy or the emotional intelligence or uh, that more, the emotional experience. So if you kind of sit with yourself, you might notice that you lean in one of those two directions. And that there's benefits to each direction and there's actually shadows to each that sometimes if we're too intellectual, we're too valuing of wisdom, we're too uh, trying to outsmart our difficulties, um, that it can, we can find that we might be a little bit cold or we might find that actually um, having all the answers to all the wrong questions um, and, and a dissatisfaction that comes with that. Uh, and the other side of the coin is, uh, you know, the uh, downside often that comes to mind is the, is the compassion fatigue syndrome that people get or the emotional burnout or the codependency or the I'll be okay when you're okay uh, and being a little bit maybe dismissive or not aware of uh, that we have to be intelligent, we have to be smart, we have to, you know, have some sort of context for why we're we doing what we're doing or how we're doing it. And so actually, I think it's actually quite hard to integrate both of these. 
And when we look at, at mindfulness practices or awareness practices, they, they tend to lean towards that sort of um, intellectual understanding. Um, which also has its benefits and its drawbacks. So the, one, of the, one of the nuts and bolts I want to talk about and, and integrate into the meditation um, is uh, when we basically look at the mind from the nuts and bolts of what is it really that happens when we come into our own direct experience is that we really have two huge components. One is attention and the other is intention. And they're both equally valuable and they're both... There's a tremendous emphasis. The whole Buddhist path actually to some degree is learning how to train both. So I want to I be able to train my attention uh, and I also want to be able to train my intention. And so you could say on some level that the attention is, is the wisdom aspect, paying attention to the right things, being able to train the attention to stay with something for a period of time. Right? And we look at the culture, right? We have attention disorder, ADD, ADHD, that actually the modern world has trained us to not be able to pay attention to one object for very long unless the object is extremely pleasant. Like, I went and saw a movie last night. I had no problem paying attention to the movie the whole two hours. I wasn't distracted at all. But when I sit in meditation every day and I try to pay attention to my breath, I can't pay attention to my breath with the same type of attention that I can give to a movie. So to some degree, we're we're just dealing with the reality of that. Uh, And even in the walking or any meditation that we really... uh, We find that attention is, is a stressful apparatus. It's also from the view of Buddhist psychology, it's present in every mind moment. So you'll never find a moment of consciousness that doesn't have attention in it, which is probably one of the reasons why it's so frustrating. Because it's And the question is, what do I do with it? Where do I put it? And most of us like to skip around. I like to put it on my phone, mm-hmm. on my computer, on my coffee, on my... Co- like we, we feel sometimes regulated by that which actually creates a sense of disintegration. It, it, it creates a sense of not wholesomeness. It, it creates separation. And which, which is the most pleasant item that I can place my attention on right now? I'm on my phone for a little while. That becomes unpleasant. I put that down. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. You'll get up and go to the bathroom. I've got to go back to my phone. What's driving that? Mostly it's, a, it's driven by a, a sort of blind driver. Right? And this is where... The intention is so important, right? And so we sit in meditation. I bring my attention to my breath. My intention is to stay with that. But when my attention wanders off to the breath, I have to go back and sort of rescue it or or get it and guide it back. But how am I guiding it back? Am I angry about it? Am I frustrated? Am I critical? Am I judgmental? Am I being kind as I retrain my attention? Probably most of us find not so much, actually. Actually, we, every time we bring the attention back to the, de- to the desired meditation object, there's a, a little bit of a critical, kind of harsh, uh, angry maybe, blame. I'm not good at this. So we're, on one end, we are training the attention to come back, but we're also not being very aware of at all or not paying attention to or being mindful of the way in which we're guiding it back, which I would say is more the emotive, the more uh, subtle, the ethical. Um, And so we are so um, focused on the object or the location of the attention, but not very aware of the ethical context in which we are moving the attention from one item to another. And I, I found for me that actually that's way more valuable and way more important. It's not what I'm paying attention to and how well I'm able to pay attention to that thing, but how am I sort of treating myself in that endeavor? And so, again, we have these two ideas. I think that to some degree this is almost a, this is sort of the talk I feel like I would give over and over and over again because I think it's so important but also we have to remember also that there's that when we look at the nuts and bolts of meditation there's a huge difference and we get this confused a lot there's a difference between skills and qualities so med- there's meditation skills and so 
training the attention as a meditation skill. But then there's a quality that I experience. So as I'm bringing my attention to my breath over and over and over again, what will happen, might happen, is I might have this quality of being more at ease or this quality which is called samadhi, which is collectedness, wholeness. Right? I might feel more at ease. My mind maybe will stop wandering. I might feel more connected to my experience. I might even feel more kindness for myself. I might not also as well. But that might happen. But that's a quality of meditation. That's a quality of experience. And usually what we do is we put the cart before the horse. Where we come into meditation, we're like, I want to experience some nice meditative qualities. But I don't really want to do a whole hell of a lot to get there. I actually want to sit down, close my eyes, and just be at ease. Totally awesome, present time, pleasant time awareness for me. Anything less than that is bad and wrong, and I must not be doing it right. So if I'm coming right into the <coughs> practice with that, I'm probably going to be uh, disappointed or frustrated. So again, we have to be clear about what that is. So you know, we do the uh, mindfulness is about to some degree training the attention. Uh, meta practices or the practice that Steve did was about trying to get us to train our intention. Can I have the intention of uh, wishing well, goodwill towards myself? And he went through all the categories, so good. Can I, can I do it for a person that is my benefactor, somebody that's easy? Right? Oftentimes when I, when I think about a room like this, it's like, you know, think of a friend that you haven't seen in a long time, somebody that you really love, that you really care about. If they were to walk through the door right now and you saw them, you would, you would light up with a, with a meta quality. You wouldn't have to do any training. That quality would just naturally arise as you came into contact with that person as they walked into the room. Right? And so can I foster that towards, uh, of course, the easy person is the easy person, but can I do it for a neutral person? Maybe the person at the coffee shop or a coworker that I, somebody in the HR department or wherever that person that you know but you haven't spent much time with, you have no feeling towards. And then the difficult person. I'm sure there's, you could think of somebody who could walk through the room right now and you would be not that happy to see them right now. <laughs> be like, oh, that, him again, or her again. Or, you know. and so again, can I wish well? Can I have that same goodwill towards that, that person? And probably we'd find out maybe not so much. Right? But I would like to be able to do that. I don't want my kindness to be conditional on whether they're a pleasant person or not. Because I don't know what your life is like, but I run into lots of unpleasant people every day. Mm. And if my happiness and my goodwill and my uh, inner life is dependent upon uh, the object that I come into contact with being pleasing... Again, I'm probably going to find that uh, I'm not going to be, uh, I'm going to be aggravated and disappointed constantly. And so we just notice that there's this. And, and so these two ways of operating, and, and they're both very, very valuable. They both end in the experience of equanimity. Mindfulness practices leads to a, a balanced mind, heart, body. The meta practices, the wishing well, also does the same thing. But you can't have one without the other. Is sort of the paradox of practice, I think. Um, so again, when we come into the context, we, we might want to notice... Um, one thing that I've noticed that's been really helpful for me is whatever meditation practice I get introduced to, the one that I really dislike the most okay. is probably the one that I should be practicing the most. You know, when I first learned about meta practices, this wishing well and may you be happy, and um, I was so distrusting of people in the world that I didn't actually really wish that upon anybody. I just said, you know, not may you be, well, will, 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 really the intention was, will you just leave me alone? <laughs> <laughs> you know, be at ease over there, <laughs> be happy, <laughs> but don't subject me to any of it. <laughs> sort of dismissive at bay and so it's taken me a long time to come into some sort of understanding of that so what I want to do actually here and we'll do a, maybe another 30 minute meditation and then we'll have actually quite some time to talk about everything 
is, is, is what, I, what I call it, what, what's known as metta vipassana, which is a which is actually going into the meditative experience with the goodwill intention, uh, and then practicing with, with with vipassana or insight, mindfulness of seeing, can I be at ease with uh, change? Can I be at ease with the fact that life is constantly in change and constantly in flux? Uh, can I be at ease with uh, the fact that life is difficult? May I be at ease with the, uh, the disappointment and the aggravation and the unpleasant people and the unpleasant weather and all of the things of life? May I be at ease with that? And also know that that's going to happen. So part of it is knowing that things are changing, being at ease with it. Part of it is knowing that things are difficult at times. And then probably the hardest part of all of that is may I be at ease with... Uh, my ego or myself. May I, may I not judge, criticize. May I be compassionate and forgiving. Uh, may I be at ease with just the reality of the fact that I have this thing called the self that I carry around with me everywhere I go. I can't seem to get, get away from it. Uh, and it oftentimes has lots of unhelpful uh, comments to make about how and why things are happening and what I'm doing. Um, and so again, we and then so I, as we move through those three kind of characteristics of experience, we we go into the body and we notice that the the body's changing, it's aging. The body also has pain and difficulty. And I'm not my body. My body has changed. Uh, and so trying to bring that into the ground, so that way we're entering as we walk through the doorway of the meditative experience, where we're being actually kind of well informed to some degree, about what, what our expectations might be. Right? And not using meditation practice as another you know, thing that I need to learn and master to have some sort of result and not putting so much value on the technique of meditation, but actually being aware of the, um, how would I say this, uh, valuing the experiential nature of it. You know, that that's really what's going to actually provide you with some degree of insight and understanding and compassion is how I'm experiencing what's happening when I'm meditating rather than being fixating on getting all the checklists right. I did that, I did breathing for five minutes, and then I did that, I checked. And we want to get a little gold star all the way down the list. Which is, again, technique is important. It's not bad or wrong, but we have to be careful that we don't put all our eggs in one particular basket of of the experience. So I think that's all I want to say about that. And let's uh, do uh, probably about 30 minutes or so of of actually everything I just said (laughs) and uh, have some discussion about that.